Discovery Audio. Hello, everyone. I'm an indigenous elder of the Eastern Cherokee and Muscogee tribes, and you're listening to the Awakened Underground podcast. This podcast represents the opinions and experience of its hosts and guests for educational and informational purposes only. Psychedelic plant medicines are sacred technologies that have been stewarded by indigenous people around the world since before recorded history. As these indigenous wisdoms enter the mainstream culture, we ask you to please operate from a place of respect and reciprocity. As to end the exploitation and colonization of First Nations people. It's imperative to use immense caution when embarking on your journey to work with psychedelic medicines, as they are powerful tools for human transformation that are not to be taken lightly. Information shared within this podcast should not be taken as medical advice. Awakened Underground, its guests and partners are not liable for any actions of your choosing. With that said, we, we trust, trust you will make responsible and ethical choices under your own free will. This is your brain on drugs. This is your brain on drugs. America's public enemy number one. To a new and dangerous area, the use of hallucinogens. Bad trip, the bummer, the freak out, even a flip out. Don't let drugs ruin your future. Both call it not a war on drugs, but a war on consciousness. The- You are now entering the Awakened Underground Podcast. What's up, everyone? This is the Awakened Underground Podcast, your guide to the psychedelic revolution. I'm your host, Cody Blue, and on today's episode, we are going to be exploring the science of psychedelic medicines. The scientific history of psychedelics in the West begins in 1938 when Dr. Albert Hoffman was working on the partial synthesis of ergobasin, a compound derived from ergot, a hallucinogenic fungus that grows on bread. When he accidentally ingested a microscopic amount of lysergic acid-25, better known as LSD or acid. Curious by the effects of that experience, he subsequently carried out a self-experiment to confirm that it was indeed the LSD-25 that was the psychoactive compound he had experienced, ingesting 250 micrograms to see what would happen, which by the way is a catastrophically large dose But he had no way of knowing that, because up until that point, no other chemical had ever been synthesized to produce physical effects at a lower dose. That was, at least, until that fateful day, because on Dr. Hoffman's bicycle ride home from work, he was hit with the first ever full-blown LSD experience. When he suddenly became unsure if he was moving or not moving, as his consciousness began to transcend space-time itself. Fortunately for him, he was able to make it home safe thanks to his extremely concerned and loyal assistant who did his best to help his boss get home, even though Dr. Hoffman repeatedly kept insisting that he was absolutely fine and that the floor was lava, the floor was lava, the floor was lava. I'm kidding, but I'm sure that it was a real awkward experience for his assistant, doing everything in his power not to freak out his boss and get fired. As soon as they got to Dr. Hoffman's house, they called his personal physician and had him immediately come over for fear that Albert Hoffman was dying or losing his mind. Apparently, when the doctor got there, Hoffman was tripping so bad that he was having a total freakout. Overcome with fear and dread, as everyone around him transformed from familiar faces to having extremely grotesque, superficial masks on. But Hoffman's doctor checked him out and said his vitals were completely normal outside of his pupils being fully dilated. That was enough to help Dr. Hoffman calm down and gradually turn his trip from a horrific experience to a positive one, bringing about intense but blissful visions of sacred geometrical patterns and alternating colors. The next day, Hoffman awoke feeling refreshed and lighter than ever as a result of his psychedelic trip. At the time, the scientific breakthrough was coined as psychomimetic and was believed to be the key to better understanding schizophrenia and mental illness, as the drug was thought to mimic psychosis, granting clinicians access to better understand mental breaks. This mischaracterization is actually the genesis of people believing LSD makes you go insane, even though it has proven to be very safe for the large majority of people in the right set and setting. Much of the early psychomimetic research was covertly sponsored by a CIA project known as MKUltra. After World War II, the government was on a hunt to find a truth serum that could be used to extract information from its enemies, and LSD was one of the primary drugs of study. 
MKUltra and the U.S. government was eventually exposed for a number of unethical and unconstitutional scandals, including the drugging of many American citizens without prior knowledge or consent, including an army chemist who freaked out and committed suicide, which led to the discontinuation of research into LSD by the government as we know it. That and the fact that LSD wasn't a very good mind control drug at all. In fact, it did the exact opposite and broke people free of societal programming and transcend subservience teaching them how to tap into the well of knowledge within and think for themselves. From this initial psychomimetic model, two new paradigms emerged, both based on therapy, psychoanalytic therapy and psychedelic therapy. These are the two base models we still use today, so I would like to take a moment to explain each. Psycholytic therapy is a formula I would characterize as a microdose model. It is rooted in low doses of psychedelics given on multiple separate occasions accompanied by the assistance of traditional psychotherapy. Psycholytic therapy offered immediate advantages to the other most commonly used therapies at the time, which was primarily electroshock therapy. The theory behind psycholytic therapy is based on Freudian psychoanalysis. The idea is that LSD and other psychedelics inhibit synapses in the brain involved with maintenance of ego identity. This leads to a breakdown of ego defenses and boundaries, resulting in depersonalization derealization, and mystical experiences which may enable the patient to see some of their conflicts more clearly. The second model is psychedelic therapy. Psychedelic therapy is a model I would characterize more closely to a ceremonial model, where you take a macro dose of a psychedelic, or a warrior's dose as our shamanic teachers would call it, as to elicit one singular breakthrough experience and a cosmic mystical experience, where oneness and ecstatic joy are attained. This model of psychedelic therapy has been the foundation of working with sacred plant medicines by First Nations people for thousands and thousands of years, but was first developed in the West by Dr. Abraham Hoffer and Dr. Humphrey Osmond in 1953. Still operating from the psychomimetic point of view, their initial studies focused on healing alcoholism by trying to induce in their patients an experience of rock bottom that many former alcoholics reach before becoming sober, where they literally have delirium, tremens, and hallucinations. This gave these doctors the idea to literally give their patients LSD and try to induce a horrifying, rock-bottom-like experience that would frighten their patients so bad that they would never want to drink alcohol ever again. And instead of telling you what happened here, let me just quote Dr. Abram Hoffer instead, and I quote, We began to treat alcoholics with LSD, trying to make them have this absolutely horrific experience. To our amazement, we found that we couldn't. In spite of everything we tried, they'd have a good experience. They enjoyed it. They felt good. They saw strange things. They were excited about it. <laughs> After many failed attempts at this, they decided to change their approach and focus on making their patients have a good, transcendental experience while attempting to heal with LSD, a set and setting that introduced pleasant, non-threatening stimulus and talked them through their experience, helping them better relate to their alcohol addiction. Go figure, this led to a far better result in healing their patient's addiction and introduced the importance of set and setting into the scientific landscape of psychedelic research. The new emphasis from here on out was on inducing a mystical type of experience so that patients would go through an almost religious conversion and give up their drinking for good. The only problem was that this shattered the psychomimetic model, so after that, Osmond coined the term psychedelic as to destigmatize LSD from the outdated perspective of viewing LSD as inducing a psychotic state of being. This led to an eruption into the clinical use, research, and hunt for psychedelic medicines. Ethnobotanist Gordon Wasson went on a search to find a mythical, hallucinogenic plant used in the religions of the native tribes of the South American rainforest and returned with the psilocybin mushroom or as they called them, Teononacatl, meaning the flesh of the gods. With this discovery, a new, more powerful psychedelic medicine entered the scientific landscape that induced a gentler, but far more powerful mystical experience than LSD. I also want to note that this was the first recorded offense of psychedelic biopiracy in the West, where a Western colonial extracted a religious sacrament from the indigenous land without consent of the indigenous people. Between the 60s and the 70s, these substances escaped the laboratories and entered the mainstream culture for the first time, spawning the greatest counterculture movements the world has ever seen. 
Mass consciousness was affected so dramatically by psychedelics that they helped catalyze enormous civil rights movements and protests for racial equality, gender equality, sexual equality, fiscal equality, animal equality, and demands to end the senseless wars of those decades, especially America's inhumane occupation of Vietnam. The seismic upheaval in the culture sent shockwaves through the power structures, causing parents to panic and media and governmental factions to crack down on the use of psychedelics, citing it as being highly dangerous. But at the congressional hearings conducted in 1966, it became clear that the worry wasn't really the few cases where a bad reaction led to long-lasting damage in someone, but rather the non-conformist attitude that seemed prevalent among the majority of LSD users at the time. Sidney Cohen himself, when testifying at the hearing, said, and I quote, We have seen something in which a way is most alarming, more alarming than death in a way, and that is the loss of all cultural values. These people are deculturated, lost to society, lost to themselves. And to comment on that quote, I'd like to say that Sidney isn't wrong about psychedelics deculturating the masses. But what I'd like to say to him and everyone else is that you can't spell culture without the word cult. And liberating us from the cult of culture is exactly the point of psychedelic medicines. Their very gift is that they can liberate us all from a toxic culture that we did not choose but inherited. A culture that normalizes inequality, incarceration, sexism, ageism, racism, homophobia, tribalism, violence, homelessness, war, oppression, corporate greed, materialism, corruption, animal enslavement and slaughter, obscenity, genocide, genetic modification, money and politics, duality, environmental injustice, and a legion of unconscious behaviors that we must put an end to. That is exactly why indigenous people call psychedelic plant medicines teacher plants. And that is exactly what psychedelic medicines have to teach us. Everyone wants to heal, but no one wants to change, and we need to change more than ever. And that change will result in the complete deconstruction of our culture, a complete rewiring of our brains that will give us a healthier perspective on our reality and teach us how to transform society and build a better world for us all, because we are not well until all of us are well. These governmental and media crackdowns of the 60s and 70s led to the wide-scale criminalization of psychedelic medicines, labeling them as a Schedule One substance, declaring psychedelic medicines to be highly dangerous drugs of abuse with no medicinal value whatsoever. Gasoline was poured onto the fire when Nixon declared a war on drugs in 1971 to combat illegal drug use by greatly increasing penalties, enforcement, and incarceration which we now know was a political move made to stamp out the hordes of Vietnam War protests sweeping the nation and arrest people of color to fill the privatized prison systems. These medicines remained in the underground ever since with no credible scientific studies allowed to be performed on them until 1991 when Dr. Rick Straussman was able to get approval for a study on a relatively less known substance known as dimethyltryptamine or DMT. DMT is a chemical that is naturally occurring in nature and also naturally made in the human brain, specifically secreted when you are born, when you dream, and when you die. This has led this compound to being given the nickname, the spirit molecule. And it actually is one of the main active ingredients in ayahuasca, the most powerful psychedelic medicine I have ever worked with personally. This mysterious chemical is believed to be secreted from the pineal gland that is located right in the center of your forehead, in between your eyes, in the exact place Eastern mystics have referenced for thousands of years as the presence of the third eye, the location where humanity can gain access to spiritual visions. When you smoke or ingest this chemical DMT, you can have interdimensional encounters that truly must be experienced to be fully understood. Most people categorize it as seeing beyond the veil of ordinary reality, astral projecting from your body into other worlds, merging with the universal consciousness, and having a direct communication with another dimension, often populated by otherworldly beings. So little was known about the chemical at the time that Dr. Rick Strassman was able to get approval for the first legal studies into DMT. And with the studies being a resounding success for proving the potential medicinal applications of psychedelic medicines once again, it opened the door for more research to be granted into the potential healing capabilities of psychedelic medicines in the modern age. Since then, a change in the attitude of government, corporate, and public opinion has transpired around the use of psychedelics in medical and scientific research. In the United States, applications for grants for psychedelic research with human subjects have been made and granted, most notably work on DMT, psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, ayahuasca, San Pedro, and iboga. Several organizations now exist to promote research into psychedelics, offering grants and a forum for results to be presented. The foremost of these is MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. 
On today's episode, we have with us the brilliant Dr. Nicholas Bruce, a psychedelic psychotherapist who is a supervisor for MAPS, training the first wave of psychedelic clinicians that are going to be deployed out into the world. Dr. Bruce is a pioneer and a genius in the field of psychedelics and mental health. He is also a true blue awakened man of the modern kind, and he is here to teach us a little bit more about the science and recent studies of psychedelic medicines. There's a lot of talk, hype, and research surrounding psychedelic medicine. The research suggests psilocybin reduces the brain's response to negative emotional stimuli. Effects after the first treatment were profound. I really did have this kind of oceanic, you know, ego dissolving experience. I was seeing things a lot differently for the first time since childhood. Today, the DEA restricts psychedelics as schedule one drugs with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. So the American government was waging a war on drugs because Nixon wanted to get elected. The Awakened Underground Podcast. I'd love to start by having you talk a little bit about how you got into working with psychedelic medicines. Sure thing. Yeah. So my younger self is shocked that I am a psychedelic psychotherapist and researcher. <laughs> not what I not what I set out like when I grow up, I'm going to be, yeah, wasn't on the radar. Grew up in the Midwest, was an athlete, uh, played football in high school and college. Me so so didn't uh stayed away from drugs because it was also uh, brought up in the, you know, DARE program. Right, that right. That was at my school. Same, same. Just say no, you know, the egg on the, and the intro, I love your guys' intro. It like, it, it, there's a lot in there that, that, that it speaks to the stigma of which these medicines um, have imbued along the way, though the research changing. So grew up in the Midwest um, and just to you know, they got me. They got me that drugs are scary and bad, and there's no use for them. So, flash forward um, in a, in my 20s in a self discovery period, and I got very into mindfulness meditation. Had been doing retreats, and this one particular retreat, a long retreat, three months, silent meditation. Oh wow! Yeah, where? Um, it was in Western Massachusetts, um, the Insight Meditation Society. Um, it kind of mimics the rains retreats uh, in Southeast Asia. So they, they've done this for every year for like 40 some years. Oh my God, man. Yeah, it was, it was incredible, very informative for the rest of my life. So silent meditation retreat, meditating 14, 15 hours a day. And about two and a half months into that retreat, uh, there's an, uh, just another day of doing what we're doing, meditating. This is a very memorable day. Because uh, in the evening, the, the bell rang. We're in the meditation hall, this big, beautiful meditation hall. Everyone's filing out. And I sit a little bit longer and a little bit longer and a little bit longer. And then I get up to walk out of this empty hall and something, you know, kind of just grabs me and I decide to sit back down on, on a cushion. And as I plop down, I close my eyes and I blast off. Wow. So I have never had a psychedelic up until this point. I am totally naive to, to psychedelics. And I was flying through the cosmos. I was the cosmos. Uh, the things we hear about high psychedelic doses, right? Uh, oceanic bliss, uh, unity consciousness, ego death, that's all happening. Right, right. Whew. Did you, let me just, uh, because I love getting into the specifics of an awakening experience. Did you see a light start to form at first or did you, did your consciousness just expand beyond your body to the point where you began to astral travel? Like what was the astral projection like? The latter, just to describe it in one word. um, Well, first it can't be. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right, right. Uh, What is that saying? Uh, The Tao that is spoken, the is not the Tao, so to speak. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So we're we're just referring to a space here. And that space was just continuously and exponentially expansive. So to put words to it was, is really challenging. I would open my eyes and here I was in this deafening silence of this open meditation hall by myself, close my eyes back traveling. It was wild, very exciting. Whoa! And then at some point, uh, fear 
cr crept back in. Hello, ego is back. And I went to bed that night hoping, wishing that I would wake up my normal self so that I wouldn't have to be carted out of this right. meditation retreat in a straitjacket. Right. right. What if I never go back? Exactly. Am I losing my mind? Exactly. What if I'll never be the same? What if, right. Yeah. Right. So my first psychedelic experience had nothing, there was no psychedelic medicine involved. I woke up, you know, ordinary state with a lot of relief, um, but changed, you know, changed from that expansive experience. Uh, jump forward. I'm in grad school. So I'm going to grad school for psychotherapy. Went on to get a doctorate. And now I'm working in uh, private practice. Uh, I'm seeing a range of, of clients. And as a side gig, uh, because I had been so impacted by the mindfulness work, I created a nonprofit called Compassion LA, which me and some colleagues were teaching mindfulness meditation and self-compassion courses around LA to groups and in hospitals. Beautiful. From time to time, we would invite a speaker to come. And so I invited a speaker uh, who um, developed a certain form of psychotherapy called, his name is Dick Schwartz, and the form of IFS, uh, the form of therapy is called IFS, Internal Family Systems. Are you familiar? I'm, I'm not actually, not yeah. IFS. Well, quick side note, it's all the rage in psychedelic assisted therapy oh, because wow. it blends so well the multiplicity of mind and there's these different aspects that really relate to like non pathologizing and compassion based. So, Is it a vitalistic system, like a holistic way? Well, extremely psycho holistic. Cool. There's a there's a there's a sense of a higher self, inner healer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he 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 comes out, he he graciously accepts my invitation, and now he's he's speaking to this this group uh, in LA. I'm in the front row. And I, I know the model inside and out. At that point, I'm already certified. Uh, but he shows a clip, a video from a research study, a research study using MDMA to treat post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Amazing. And in this clip, there is a veteran who's describing some memories from war, some gnarly shit, like buddies getting blown up kind of shit. And he's describing it in a way as if he's a little bit removed from it or the fear is like turned down in some way. He's like being, he's able to connect with this material in a way that is, in my view, is extremely healthy and useful. And I can see that he's processing this very challenging material. My mind was blown. It was akin to like, so we're here in LA, we're on, on the West Coast. Right. Let's say we wanted to get to New York. We could walk there, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Or we could fly. And from that, I saw, and since it's been reinforced, that working uh, psychedelics in the context of psychotherapy is like getting on a jet. It's another way, it's another means of transportation. So I committed in that moment, that afternoon, like, I got to get involved in this. This is amazing work. Had you worked with MDMA at all up until this point? Zero. Zero? Have yeah. you worked with MDMA since then? I have. That was, uh, and uh, legally, as part of a, um, a research study, an optional part of a training that I later did with MAPS. So after this presentation, and I committed to be a get involved with this, there was some luck, there was some grace-filled kind of situation where I got connected with this group forming in LA that were going to do a part of the research for that same study that I was witness to. That was an earlier uh, phase of the study. So I, I got involved, I got trained by MAPS, I'm a co-therapist. I say co-therapist because the therapy model is they have two therapists in the room. Beautiful. Is it same or different gender? Do they make sure it's male and female? Well, we start out with male and female in the room. Amazing. And my sense of that is just it's, it's we tend to grow up with uh, right. different genders. I feel like in, it's in super this space. important. It is, and Maps uh, has responded to the times and is also open to you know same gender. Right. Yeah, right. because we all carry that different energy, and the projection can be there. True. Kind of transcending that binary. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So working with Maps have gone on to be a um, supervisor to help train the, the next wave. But here's the thing: I found very quickly, like, oh my god. This is amazing, and yet we're several or many years away, um, and that was even before COVID. So I didn't know, you know, that slowed it down. Also, so I got hip to ketamine. 
ketamine and its therapeutic uh, potential. Um, got trained um, in working with ketamine in, in psychotherapy, and I do that in private practice, concierge programs that often in, in adjunct to somebody's ongoing therapy. People come to work with me to do ketamine work. And then because I'm, you know, got as much work as, as, as I can um, um, handle, I've since co-created, uh, co-founded a organization called PCH, Psychedelic Coalition for Health, where we're now training. It's two wings. We're training clinicians to work with, with psychedelic medicines, and we're also educating the public in, in this space, in the psychedelic space. Wow, amazing. And have you worked with other psychedelics besides MDMA and ketamine? So in um, there, there's what's legal, and unfortunately right now what's legal is ketamine. So I've been doing a lot of work with that, with clients, um, and I've had my own experiences with, with ketamine. And I've also um, had the opportunity, referred to earlier, to work with MDMA. I can say I'm one of the, the few that have done MDMA legally in the last uh, 20, 30, 30 years or so as part of the training. I got to sit with two senior trainers, have an MDMA, MDMA experience along with a placebo session. It oh, was cool. beautiful. And I have worked with other medicines outside of the country. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I guess to follow this train of thought, I'm really curious what your experience was. Uh, what other psychedelic medicines have you worked with in a legal context outside of the country? Yeah, outside of the country, um, I did a long retreat with Gabor Mate, who's a Canadian. You know, okay, great. You know him for your for your listeners, Canadian physician, who's really dialed in on trauma and the roots of trauma. One of his many quotable lines: "It's not the addiction, but let's, let's get to know the pain." You know, so he was not serving. Uh, ayahuasca medicine. There was a, a, a troop doing that, but he was doing the, the process team around that. So I've had amazing experiences with ayahuasca, um, also 5-MeO DMT, um, psilocybin, and, and some other substances. Amazing. Okay. So the gamut. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. what, uh, incredible. So amazing. Thank you for the work you're doing seriously and being like a pioneer and a, a leader of this movement in the West. I would love to know, as a doctor, what was your personal experience working with MDMA and ketamine? Was it healing for you? What was, you know, going from being on the outside looking in, but seeing it was helpful to people, and then someone actually participating in these studies? Mm -hmm. What was MDMA and ketamine like for you? Yeah, so so ketamine, The actually the first time I did ketamine, I'm like, that was wild and interesting, but I didn't get the therapeutic benefits of it. And then the next time I did it, it was a very different, it was within the confines of a training. And I had an amazing experience. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get into talking about set and setting, but this, the container was such that I could really go inside. I didn't have, I didn't have concerns of the, the space around me. And while I, I didn't carry around in my day to day a worry about death or dying, very early in that experience, I had a direct, I'll call it a direct experience of, 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 of dying or, or not coming back. Right. That makes sense? Yeah, of course. And it was peaceful and it was beautiful and it has forever um, um, impacted the way I, I am in the world. There's also a lot of insight that can arise in, 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 and has arisen in subsequent um, ketamine experiences. This this is a really interesting paradigm because there's a lot of different thoughts and beliefs and stigmas when it comes to these modalities, whether they be synthetic mm -hmm. or plants, mm -hmm. uh, plant based, or a without using a outside substance, uh, having direct spiritual experience. And some people think it's like a you know it's a cheat or something using the using using a tool. Were you able to achieve a comparable spiritual state of a, a conscious and awakened state, even working with a synthetic such as ketamine or MDMA? Was it comparable or did you feel like it was different and unique? I'm smiling really big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Why is that? Because um, a big, huge yes, like 10 feet tall yes, yes standing, right, right? standing behind me. Well, dude, yeah. that's the amazing thing is, right? So me and my, uh, my fiance... And my family will hold some ceremonies outside of the country. 
And we've also worked with medicine facilitators who will use MDMA and ketamine mm-hmm. in conjunction with plant medicines. Yeah. Uh, the ketamine almost and the MDMA both have a similar effect to open your heart and disassociate or and or disassociate you enough that when you have that very intimidating death like experience or that interface within other extra dimensional consciousness, mm-hmm. you're not going to freak out, run for the hills, shut up off, and then essentially be put through hell. You're going to open up to it and allow uh, allow the healing to take place, which has been really amazing as a as a tool to to use for ceremony. It can be a little bit harder for people to retain the experience there uh, sometimes, uh, but at the same time, yeah, I mean, I I I find that they sort of. They're not mutually exclusive, these modalities. There is more of a spirit to, let's say, ayahuasca, wachuma, bovansana, psilocybin. But, you know, we all have a spirit. There's a spirit within us. There's a there's an all-pervading force that can still be called in and accessed while using a synthetic compound. So it's super cool to hear you say that it's on the level of your awakening doing a three-month meditation experience. Yes, it is. And 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 by what you just said, I, 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 I get that you know the space. <laughs> You've been doing some traveling. Excellent. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited that in, let's say, a couple years' time, if not a little bit longer, that we're going to have these options. You know, we've already mentioned, you know, we've, we've gone out of the country to use these medicines. And that in a couple years' time, that they'll be more available here and now with people that, you know, speak our exact same language and that we can have um, the kind of care that, that we want to need in, in a lot of different spaces. So these medicines can be used in a lot of different ways. Plants, synthetics can be used in combination. Mm-hmm. To, to me and my kind of research mind is we kind of start with things, we isolate different things and we work and we, we notice how one medicine works and we start to combine and, and see what other, right. what other benefits come from that. But you're absolutely spot on with the, um, the, depth or the, the, the distance or the, the what can arise with a synthetic medicine versus a plant is, I mean, one, one of my colleagues says, you know, it, it's just different ways to get there. And there's, there is, there is difference to, to use the example of MDMA and um, ketamine. MDMA we tends to keep your personal narrative online. Right, you're not going to see hallucinations. You're not going to see things, um, but it turns the fear down. Yeah, it's know? that heart opener. Heart opener really right. puts people in the heart, and yeah. allowing people to access these states of consciousness from the heart is like, I don't. I mean, like half the battle. I mean, from even from my own experience. I mean, like this is the most working with psychedelic uh, plants because I've spent years first working with just plants. Mm-hmm. I mean, the experiences can be, they're incredibly intimidating and they were horrific for me and very traumatizing. I mean, ayahuasca a few weeks in the jungle was traumatizing for me. Uh, but at the same time, let me, let me, I don't want to disrespect this plant because let me, <laughs> let me tell you a little something. But the first ceremony was so scary for me. Like I didn't expect like to interface with extra dimensional consciousnesses and, on that level, I kind of just thought it was like animism, you know, it was just something lost in translation mm. and there was a scientific explanation for it. And I was so intimidated. And the next time I went to the, 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 the day or two later, I went to my next ceremony and someone, the shaman said to me, well, you can just ask the spirit of the medicine to not, you know, ask her and she'll, she'll stop. You tell her, turn it off, turn it on. So I went to the ceremony, I walked to the altar and I said, please, like, I don't want to, an experience like to myself or to the spirit. Mm-hmm. I said, please, like, I'm not ready for this. I, I, I please like, don't make it conscious work on me on the subconscious. I'm sitting in the ceremony, never comes. Wow. Sitting there hours, three hours, four hours, never comes. Everybody's purged in their bucket. And I go, okay, I think I'm ready for an experience. Next thing I know, <laughs> fractal start, the room spin. I'm like, oh no. Yeah. And I go right in as soon as I yeah. said, and what you start to realize it's a dance uh, when it comes to those plants, a little bit more than with the synthetics. It's a little more chemical, but you still have those entry points. Yeah, totally fascinating. I really want to highlight one aspect that you're describing there. You're describing a relationship with the medicine. whether And let's say whether it's plant-based uh, which many of the synthetics are actually plant-based, but whether it's synthetic or, or a straight-up plant, to be in relationship with with these medicines, um, we get we're wounded 
often wounded in relationship, and we can do healing in relationship, relationship to the medicine, relationship to the, to the therapist, the guide, the sitter who's there as well. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So psychedelics have, there's not a ton, there was not a tremendous amount of public research. There was some, and now there's a boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, for the audience, like, can you kind of explain what happened, why there wasn't a ton of research, and also get a little bit into the evidence? Because I want to call this episode The Science of Psychedelic mm-hmm. Medicines, and mm-hmm. I would love for you to provide some of the top studies. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I see you have some papers. If you want to reference them, like, please, like, now's the time to kind of put people's fears at ease and show that, and bring science along for the ride so we can start to trans culturally transition to open up to, to the power of psychedelic medicines. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes, yes. He said dancing. Let's get dancing with this. Yeah, bro. So perhaps we'll start with just um, defining the term psychedelic. So it comes from a combination of two Greek words, psyche, which means mind or soul, and delune which means um, manifesting or revealing. So we're mind manifesting or soul revealing. I want to highlight something there that oftentimes people can uh, think of psychedelics and they're like things come in to this space or they see things that arise from the outside. Whereas my orientation is that these, these help the connectivity, and there's research around this, help the connectivity in the brain and it can also help us access our unconscious or aspects about ourselves that as we bring them forward into our life, and then our relationships improve. Our relationship with ourself, our relationship with others, our family, friends, coworkers, and the planet. So that's psychedelic. That's what that's what we're talking about. The history is goes way back as far as um, like thousands of years. There are caves in, 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 in France and Spain that have, uh, that have mushrooms uh, in these caves. There are cultures around the world that have used different psych- psychedelics for healing, for rituals, for rite of passage, for creative inspiration. So, so in a way, th- there's nothing new here. Right. Yeah. We are beginning to study it, and as you rightly named, that there's a resurgence that's that's up right now. Remembering. <laughs> remembering. remembering. So much of this is like the foundation of religion, culture. Mm. And talk about like, a, you know, the fertility cult, Ulysses, mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, yeah. everything, man. Yeah, so I feel you. Yeah, right on. So of kind of contemporary, and, and even like a hundred years ago, uh, Hefner, this gentleman, uh, isolated mescaline from peyote. Uh, Freud um, was wrote about cocaine and was using it. I mean, hell, you could you could get opium and cocaine over the counter, no no problem. But as far as the research, it really um, picked up in the 40s, really in the 50s and 60s. Um, a lot of research on LSD um, and, and other compounds. And then there was uh, uh, the the 70s, which um, 70s. Uh, put a big bump in the road as far as psychedelic research. Did that come from the war on drugs and uh, Nixon's movement to squash the Vietnam war protests? You're spot on. So, Which we know was a false flag attack. We, we invaded this country. It was completely wrong and immoral. It's proven now that we should yes. not have been there and the protests were completely validated mm-hmm. and weaponizing the drug war against the people to squash a movement of social justice and peace. Mm-hmm. This is an atrocity. Atrocity. Exactly. And, and to see also how the drug war has been was weaponized against the people and to completely deflate and dehumanize and to take the wind out of our sales and squash these movements. It's it, it's one of the greatest reasons why the drug war needs to be, really should have ended and needs to end. Sorry, I didn't mean to go. No, I bro. love it. You're you're <laughs> on point, my man. Um, you nailed it. That the the war on drugs was not a war on drugs. How could you have a war on an inanimate object anyway? But it was a war, uh, a way to uh, control and disrupt. Uh, political activists mm-hmm. and people of color. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Yep, people of color. It's a racist movement. You cannot yeah. be pro drug war and anti racism. Yeah, it and is a racist movement. And just one example of that: um, cocaine and um, crack. It's synthetically, it's the same. It's the exact same, but pre- but in a different form. And the laws for penalties for crack versus cocaine 
are wildly out of disproportionate. Right. And, and was, wasn't obviously that, they're targeting uh, different communities, black is, communities. Isn't there evidence that the government was funneling crack into the ghettos to fill the prison systems? I This is the look of not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read that myself, but I'm like... I, I could do your own research on that. I was, but, but yeah, so keep going, bro. Yeah. So, okay, we're in the 70s so and we're, then we hit our speed bump. We hit the speed bump uh, and sadly of almost a full s- spot and it really... Um, impacts my heart of just knowing the, the generation or the generations that have not had access to the medicine, the right. psychedelic medicine that that the next generations will have. Absolutely. So it's this um, the goosebumps right here are uh, are about the the sadness of that and the excitement uh, of what's to come. Right. Right. There is we are we are standing in blood. There's blood on the ground. And one of the fascinating things you talk about the 50s and the 60s to the 70s is psychedelics entering the mainstream Western culture was mm-hmm. part of those massive civil rights and social justice movements. That's right. And it's really interesting to see sort of a loss of that a bit in the 80s mm. and even a little bit of the 90s, you know? Mm-hmm. So uh, so truly to understand that what these medicines, how they affected and infected the, and the consciousness of mm-hmm. the people for more equality, mm-hmm. more unity, more peace, no war, yeah. uh, you know, so it's really fascinating. I totally agree. These I hold these medicines as consciousness medicines. Right. It's a uh, Terence McKenna was was fond of saying like uh, that these drugs are illegal. It's a social uh, uh, issue. It's a so it, it, it's we we can't limit people from exploring consciousness. So in the last few decades, there's this re- resurgence, um, and there are really um, well-known, respectable universities uh, that are doing great research. John Hopkins, Yale, um, of course, in, in the 70s, um, Harvard, uh, along the way. But most currently, if I hone in on the most current research, it is that aforementioned MAPS. So MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for psychedelic studies. This is a nonprofit that got started by Rick Doblin in 1986, and they have been on a mission to make psychedelic medicines more accessible and available for healing. The, and I got to say, because as a supervisor, one love Rick Doblin and forefront godfathers of this modern mm. renaissance. I do not think we would be where we are in the modern renaissance if it wasn't for you and Maps and, and Rick. Mm. Wow. So respect. Thank you. <laughs> for there are sure, a lot man. of amazing uh, and your women team. and men that have, yeah. have come before. Yeah. yeah. Um, including Stan Groff, shout out for Stan Groff, his work with LSD, and and then the, the shift to holotropic breathwork. And we'll get into that. Oh my God, you can talk to us a little bit about holotropic breathwork? Uh, from personal experience, yeah. Okay, I mean, if, you can keep giving us this, but can we please <laughs> circle back to that? Because like, I have a movie about Johnny Mac who would use holotropic breathwork for abduction victims, Whoa. and it's one of the most fascinating things I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, not we, seen that. We, yeah, we can get into that. Okay. It hasn't come out yet. But okay, okay so 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 we, maps. Yes, this uh, nonprofit that um, his mission is to uh, make psychedelic medicines available. Their kind of flagship or, or main. Study has been MDMA for the treatment of post traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and this was the clip that I saw um, in that fateful um, presentation that turned me on to, to this work. So, a little bit of, of, of structure. So, these drugs that we've been talking about are illegal MDMA, LSD, psilocybin, um, ibogaine, uh, cannabis, actually, really, too, are they're called Schedule One. Um, so in the, the Substance Control Act of 1970, I believe, um, made these drugs not only illegal, but the most illegal. There's different, there's Schedule 1, Schedule 2, and on down to 5. And so these were very legal, high penalties for being associated or, or caught with these with these medicines. And what MAPS is looking to do is to have MDMA um be rescheduled, I'm sorry, to be approved by the FDA, which then it will be rescheduled, so by the DEA, meaning it will be able to be prescribed. 
So this is the process that MAPS is on, and they're doing all the research, tens of millions of dollars put into this, mostly by private donations in order to create this work in hundreds of of clinicians and administrators. Would this go happen. into the prescription-based pharmaceutical model for MDMA, or would you, because I have a little bit of concerns about, so I was stuck on pharmaceutical drugs for 15 years, and the interesting thing is, essentially, it's you're being addicted with a prescription. You're being said, you need this every day, and you believe that, and it's like, it's beyond addiction. Everyone's like, oh, you'll get addicted if you try this or that, but literally the prescription drug model is to keep you, it's, mm. it's a subscription model, right? Yeah. It <laughs> keeps you hooked. It doesn't heal. And my hope is that these psychotherapies and MDMA, I would worry about the stress on some of the your, your glands and your neurotransmitters with MDMA every single day. Do you think you would keep it to a therapeutic experience? Or? I so, Cody, I so appreciate your concern. <laughs> yeah, it's right. legit and it's it has foresight. Yeah, it strains your channel a little bit. I, when If I work with MDMA, it's one of the... I mean, I have to 5-HTP. I have to take certain supplements to complement it. Um, yeah, it's, 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 there's a lot to make sure it's... It, yeah, it, so it, let me reassure you. Uh, and what you said, that yeah, there is a body load and a neurochemical, right. although not neurotoxic, because that no. was pro- proven in the first couple of phases. Um, the um, way that MAPS will be rolling out MDMA upon approval... So MAPS is a nonprofit, and they are the sole owner of a B corporation, um, MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, and that's kind of the pharmaceutical branch. So when it's approved, um, fingers crossed, it's uh, heading in that way, in which uh, I'll tell you about the research, that why I'm so confident in that. When it's approved and when it's rescheduled, then MAPS, because they've put in these 30 years and $30 million plus dollars, right. they have exclusivity rights. And so they're going to help roll out MDMA. Wow. And they are going to make it um, in conjunction with therapy. Okay. So it's, you're not going to be able to go to you know Abbott Kenny and, and pop in a shop and, and buy MDMA, at least for the next seven, eight Plus, hey, plus years. People should if they want to. I mean, <laughs> but so, so, but I just want to make sure that uh, I, I, it's done as consciously as possible. I thought that ketamine and MDMA were in the public domain. So ketamine is Schedule Three, so okay. it can be prescribed and it's used therapeutically off label. Off label just means it was studied and researched for something and approved for something, and can be used prescribed for something else, which is very natural antidepressants are prescribed for depression and, right. and vice versa and many other many other drugs. So ketamine can be prescribed right now. It's, it's said to be the only legal uh, psychedelic medicine currently. MDMA is, is Schedule 1. And they're, and they're both very safe, non-toxic, non-addictive, right? I can speak to both separately. Ketamine has been studied for well over 50 years. It's super... Uh, the, the safety profile on it is is really great. Um, it um, is on the World Health Organization's 50 Most Essential Medicines. It's in hospitals around the world. Yes, it's used for in veterinarian medicine. It's also used for infants, human infants. Um, it's anesthesia is its main um, use over the years, but huh. now at sub anesthetic levels, so people aren't getting knocked out. And to your earlier point, we, when we dial in the dose, there is the capacity to create a little bit of space from one in one's experience from an internal critic, from the pain in their body, right? And get to know and learn and explore like that, right? In right. the sub anesthetic doses, again in conjunction with. Therapy. So, uh, you're gonna. I'm a kind of a broken record on this, but the, it's not just the psychedelics, but the way they're being studied is in conjunction with therapy. Right. And I'd love to take a moment to kind of like talk because one of the beautiful things about these modalities is what they teach us about vitalism and the healing, how we heal. Uh, it's really interesting because ketamine is a disassociative, and it seems almost our ego identities keep our trauma. A uh, blocked and stuck and trapped within our morphogenetic field. And when you have that disassociation or that liberation of this ego, which it seems that from an electromagnetic standpoint, that ego is keeping these traumas fixed. So once you remove that, it allows some fluidity. And when you have a clinical therapist or a medicine person, whoever, who can perhaps either coax or help you trigger that point from that safer space, you can release it. Uh, and be free of it uh, instead of being under it or at least being mm-hmm. over it, you know? Yeah, I would agree to all of that. And the, the releasing um, can be temporary, 
while the medicine is active. So this is why the, the therapy piece or the, the, the integration um, is, is such a big deal. Because what will we do when we get a respite from that inner critic or these, these tracks that we've laid down, these habits of like, oh, there's that, there's a, a, some, a feeling of vulnerability and then now here comes the fear and here, here I am doing the thing that I normally do, either attack or flee. These, these things that have deep grooves. So one way to think about it is um, with ketamine or, or with MDMA, it's more about turning down the fear that we can access and, and reprocess some of that material. With ketamine, it's kind of like, uh, do you ski or ride? Snowboard, yeah. Snowboard, yeah. So it's like fresh fresh powder. Right. Right? So even though we've had these, these, these habits in, in, literally in our in, in our um, in our brains happening, ketamine can create a little bit of space, and in that space, it's like, what do we do with it? And this is big on where, what integration comes in about how do we harvest the, the call it the highlights or the the peak moments, and then how do we do what are the habits, the lifestyle changes that we take on to build or grow on that? An example of that. Um, someone who has been very harsh with themselves kind of took on an inner critic because they grew up in a very harsh environment mm -hmm. um, to get a little bit of respite from that. As they come out of that and they feel the self-love, they feel self-compassion, then they are much more prone to do the work of a loving kindness or a, a self-compassion practice on right. the daily, which then reinforces that connection with themselves. Right. I love that. Super important for you to talk about integration. One of my great teachers always says, only take as much as you can integrate. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also, I really love your skiing and snowboarding analogy because it actually gives us a really interesting model for the brain. I was always taught that essentially every time you have a thought, it sends plaques and proteins to the brain and you create neural canals. And if you have a traumatic thought or experience, it's 10 times the plaques and proteins. And we sort of create these very deep grooves that every time you go down the mountain, you're hitting this deep, familiar groove. And it's interesting, like something in ayahuasca has been, something, a medicine like ayahuasca has been proven to dissolve those plaques and proteins so you can take new pathways. What I'm finding is, or at least it seems, with working with these medicines, they create these new sort of cuts in the powder, mm -hmm. these new mm -hmm. paths. Mm -hmm. So even if it's for that moment, I now have that path. And mm -hmm. when I go back, let's say if I'm working with MDMA and I have an ecstatic experience uh, listening to music and I dance like I dance like no one's watching. And then next thing I know, for the rest of my life, I can dance to dance. Yes. And I, I and a song comes on and I'm completely uninhibited because those pathways have been I've been made in my brain and you get to take that experience back with you. It's almost like entering these states of consciousness is like stretching. You're stretching into them and that plasticity remains. So even if you're using a tool and you can go here, there. So as an artist, I can create from me all these new spaces. I can dance, I can play, I can love, I connect, I can emote, you know, I can express love. Uh, I can be vulnerable. I can be free of pain. So it's super amazing to hear you kind of walk through this. I don't know if this is aligning with sort of what no, you're finding in man, your studies. You, you are on it. And I want to highlight f for your, your audience is that um, actually even with or without any psychedelic medicine that creating a new path is challenging. Of course, it's challenging and it's harder when we're starting out. So the medicine can give us a, uh, an experience with a medicine can give us a reference point for right. something that we want to do practices. Right. So with my private practice clients, I'm often talking about habits, lifestyle. They, they start a meditation practice before we ever introduce ketamine. Um, so there's there's the peak reference points right. that can happen uh, with medicine. And then there's how do we cultivate that into our life? I'm curious if, I mean, because you've talked a little bit about, you know, the history of psychedelics mm -hmm. and how we got here. What studies, can you go over some studies about like, what are the, what are the best studies or breakthroughs we've had? There's been a lot. It seems mm -hmm. like every day, you know, like yeah, I'm right. on a, I, I'm, I'm on, I have a couple of psychedelic projects and mm -hmm. the producers are always slipping me emails and things I've kind of known and seen mm -hmm. for a while now, but what are the, the greatest breakthroughs? Yeah. Can you share some? Yes, light, I can. Enlighten us? Yeah. It's, it, I'm excited to, and it's a really exciting time as this, this uh, information is rolling out. So, so back to maps and this, this, their kind of flagship um, study MDMA for the treatment of severe PTSD. And 
I can I can jump to the results or I can kind of tell you how the the study is structured. What would Whatever you, you feel? Cold. Would you like? You know, yeah, you do both, and then yeah. The, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so stay tuned for the uh, the the findings of the study. But the way that the study works is that people qualify with a certain level of PTSD, and there's inclusion and exclusion criteria. But there's this group, and there's a medical screening to make sure that their heart and health is is well enough to to work with. Uh, MDMA, because it has an amphetamine uh, piece to it. And then the the structure is three meetings, and this is preparation. These are about 90-minute meetings. And the therapy team, we mentioned that there's two two therapists, so these, these three meetings. And then there's a, a medicine session. That's an all-day, eight hours with this therapy um, team. Oh, wow. Yeah. But even before the working with the medicine? Well, that that's the, the medicine oh, so gotcha. wow. day. And um, it's a double blind placebo double blind study. So nobody knows if they're gonna get placebo or MDMA. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the things with working with psychedelics at some point, well, you, especially if you've ever had a psychedelic, then you may know along the way. But that said, it's a really rich space. People are getting 40-some hours of therapy. So I'll tell you both about the placebo and the and the participants that got the medicine. But the structure, these three preparatory sessions, an MDMA or placebo session, that's an all-day and they stay overnight and they're there, and then three integration sessions, and then that repeats. So over the course of about four months, people only get ketam- uh, I'm sorry, uh, MDMA three times about a month apart, and there's three oh, wow. integration sessions in between. Wow. Yeah, so only three times. Um, and to your earlier question about the neurotoxicity or, or, or concerns about that, it's not going to be prescribable. It's going to be used in conjunction with therapy. And we have found that sometimes people, after one experience, um, it just set them on a new trajectory. Right. There's some people that we wish we could have given them one more experience. Right. That's that's another thing. So, so here's the results. Here's the findings of the study. And one other thing to keep in mind as you hear these findings, MAPS did not cherry pick uh, participants for this. The average participant was suffering with PTSD for over 14 years. Many had been suicidal or attempted suicide, so a lot severe of severe cases. Severe cases. Many um, were uh, military veterans, uh, first responders, uh, sexual abuse survivors, childhood trauma. So a, a gamut here. And here are the findings: people that were in the placebo group, they got no medicine. Twenty-three percent of them did so well that they didn't qualify. For PTSD anymore. Wow. Which this is great. This is not only a, a good thing about um, therapy, but this model of therapy. And I'll say a little bit about that. The, uh, and just to, to put a headline on it, the inner healing intelligence is something that was used throughout this model. But the bigger news is that the participants that did get MDMA, and again, only these three times, 67% no what? longer qualified for the diagnosis of PTSD. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And, I, and a few things I want to say. One is I'm a huge proponent of MDMA. I work with it uh, often. And even without doing it in a clinical, uh, it, with a clinical study, the first time I worked with MDMA was changed my entire life. Hmm. Uh, just completely healed me. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a stickler for it because I think it's an important time that, and we have to be super responsible as ambassadors and harbingers of this work into the, the, the West and the modern times. So that's why I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of holding us to the fire there, but I just, I agree. I so appreciate your, your, just, your just, ethics or integrity. We, we got to try at least yeah. for, for at least if we're going to bring people into these modalities, this conversation. I also, and I know I'm taking a little tangent here, a little, I'm taking a little detour on our, on our ski slope. But the the double blind study is the funniest thing to me because it's <laughs> right. It, we we need to do this double blind study for it to be a respected mm-hmm. study, right? Yeah. But it's so funny. You're essentially you're accounting for the placebo, and it's so funny to me because one of the main things psychedelics teach you, if you're like, oh wow, well it heals you, but you also learn a lot about healing and yourself. You learn essentially reality is placebo consciousness. 
we are sort of your beliefs and your thoughts create your reality. So, but because there is no profit in mm-hmm. empowering people that their beliefs shape their own reality, we account for it with a sugar pill in all our studies instead of being like, hold up, hold up, hold up. We don't need any of the stuff we're studying. Let's just focus on the placebo or the nocebo, which is the opposite of the placebo. If you think you're going to get, if you're taking something, you're going to get ill from it, you will get ill potentially. Uh, why can you speak to this like placebo model? And is this just an antiquated model built around the, essentially the business and industry of health? A long time. I love this. <laughs> a long time ago, I remember, um, I don't remember the exact context, but I really got what placebo and how it was mentioned in all the studies. And I remember looking around in the space that I was in. I'm like, wait, <laughs> you're saying people thought they got something and they got nearly, oftentimes nearly, or sometimes even more benefit than right. the, the than the thing. So this is a whole other arena. I know, and it really but, but this blurs. is the thing, though. This is yeah. like the thing. If you're going to talk about anything, it's about psychedelics, yeah. talk about what they teach you. I didn't mean to take us on a detour, but like placebo consciousness, like that is consciousness, human consciousness. And it's that we can get the results we want by what we think we're going to get, yes. which also shapes this work, shapes the, your opinion on this stuff, reality. Essentially, it's not what's true. It's what you believe. It shapes it all. And yeah. to have it and to be in, 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 in exploration of it and in relationship with, with it and really setting up, it actually points to also setting up both preparation and intention for this work. Like a deep, a deep prayer, whatever a prayer might mean to someone, and they connect with what it is um, that they want to let go of. Like to me, that's like a, a placebo right. like, initiator. Right. So, right. so right. And I came, I didn't come to this work clinically and I only worked with psychedelic plants before I started working of the compounds you're talking about. Uh, and it was to just continue to explore and understand these fields so I could be a better, you know, service and heal. And, uh, but the main thing in being a student and a practitioner of plant medicine, shamanism, whatever you want to call it, right. Which is essentially just like, interdimensional hacking, all right? So, I mean, really what it is, but what do you learn working in these plants? Like we talked about placebo consciousness, all quote unquote shamanism is that. It's taking your mind, connecting with your heart. So you're in your heart space, you're feeling what you're thinking and being able to follow that train and you can heal people, you can heal yourself, you can visualization, breath work. I mean, this is, and this is the future of health and medicine, which we're not even there, but this is where these plants are going to push us once Uh we get them into the mainstream. Yeah, Cody, the way that you and I are both <laughs> going from shaking our heads to nodding our heads. I mean, if you're doing this work, you're right. it, it is what, what it is. It, you know, like it, space to space. Exactly. It expands the limitations of what we know mm-hmm. is possible for ourselves and for others, for relating, for rewriting um, traumatic memories, mm-hmm. but also to, to bring it to like into presence, these medicines amongst other things, including exercise and breath work and, you know, and a great diet, they can help us be more right. present. Right. Yeah. Thank you for saying that also, because I always try to disclaim like nothing is a substitute for uh-huh. eating right and yeah. exercise. Sleep. And yeah. Sleep, oh, getting your nature, yeah. breathing, mm-hmm. you know, that, do those first. <laughs> yeah. To yeah. jump back to the, to the study, because there's a kicker. So I said 67% of the people that did this four-month-ish protocol no longer qualified for, for PTSD. In the year follow-up, because this is a, is a big thing, you know, you know, people can have a, a medicine experience, and if you interview them the day after, they can be like, oh, my God, my life has changed, and boom, boom, boom. Right. But we, as we bring the uh, scientific method and, and really research to this, we need follow-up studies to see how people integrate and, and then also just education around integration. But in the year follow-up, to this study, that number increased, increased. Amazing. More people no longer qualified for PTSD. No Amazing. other interventions, no other medicine. They got better. There's a, there's a, a piece to this I want to add. My, my sense, although it's not like proven, is there's a way in which we're doing the, the therapy, which is really empowering and trusting the innate inner healer in everyone that shows up. Right. And I'm talking even for the, the placebo group, because, again, there was severe uh, suffering involved. People, uh, many, many people had to uh, taper off 
their medicine that had been buoying them up for a long time. They right. had to taper off and Same. be in this. Yeah. Yeah. I had to before working with this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So this way of working with this inner directed. So there's not as much as I love IFS. That's not the model that the, that the protocol uses. Mm-hmm. Aspects kind of emerge spontaneously, but the, it's a, we call it an inner directed. And we trust that there's an innate inner healing capacity in the same way that you and I cut our arm, break, break our arm. We can clean it and we can put it in a stint, but our body knows. Right. And our psyches, when right. we've given the uh, corrective space, a safe enough space, it can, it can heal. Right. So sort of like, uh, you know, your body can heal itself. Just don't pick the scab. Don't put dirt in the scab. So like you start to clean your body out, you start to clean your diet up. You can work with these tools and sort of bring some fluidity and flexibility and plasticity yeah. into your system so you can start to uh, go from a, a, a place of stasis to a place of movement. Yeah. You're naturally, we're naturally being pulled in this mm-hmm. expansive, we're, all, we're constantly yeah. growing and changing. It's just about like kind of knocking away those blockages that we've created. Yeah, knocking them away and taking on habits, doing the hard work Thank of you. taking on habits and lifestyle changes that reinforce that. Uh, uh, ketamine, MDMA, psilocybin, ibogaine, 5 meo you can have a peak experience but the integration starts with the preparation that this is not going to like be the thing. I really encourage all your listeners and beyond to, to hold this as an opportunity to connect with something, maybe even just your inner healer, inner knowing of what it is that you need to foster more in your life. What do you need to bring in? What are the where in relationship it feels too scary right. around intimacy? Where do you need to put up a boundary and, and right. say no where you're, you're – or you haven't in the past. I, I love that, Dr. Bruce. I feel like, so after I do any ceremony, let's say I do ayahuasca, I'll journal, right? I put everything down, right? So if I'm going to go do another medicine ceremony and I get called to do a lot of medicine ceremonies, now that I'm very in the community or in different communities, I get invited, and it's people's birthdays and you fly out, right? And I don't, but at the same time, I, I always have to check myself before I ever commit to doing any of that. So I go to my journal and I see what I learned and if uh, did I implement? Am I have I integrated? And sure enough, when I don't do that, I go back into something like ayahuasca, and you plug in, and it's hey hey, here's the lessons, and it's usually the things I didn't do straight up. No new lessons, you know. It's it's a reminder. It's a hey, this is real, and there's an all pervading mm-hmm. consciousness, and you have things to heal, and we have a goal, mm-hmm. and you know. But it's the same stuff. Yeah, it's always the same messages. Man, <laughs> you know? I appreciate your practices. I appreciate your deep listening in and outside of the space. Oh yeah, man, I'm, I'm such a student. I feel like it's humbling, humbling, mm-hmm. humbling, humbling mm-hmm. work. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I, every the deeper I go the more I know that I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, well, so like, I want to take us back to center again. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's another study. Yeah, I can yeah, talk about. yeah. That's what I was going to say. Great. So why don't you give me more studies? Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's get into mushrooms. Yeah, please. Yeah, I would love <laughs> to get into the sacred plants yeah. uh, b- uh, because I do feel like there is a little bit of a difference. Um, and as I always try to compartmentalize that a little bit, and I also think there's something in the consciousness, the public conscious around naturalism. Mm-hmm. So people, a lot of people who are turning away from the chemical based model, mm-hmm. they, there's sort of, we sort of overcorrect when mm-hmm. we a little bit. And I think that wound, uh, creates a space for a lot of these plants a bit more. They're mm-hmm. natural. There's no corporate like distortion on mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so please like we can talk about psilocybin. Yeah. So psilocybin, um, Johns Hopkins University has a super well-respected research lab. They've been at this early in the, in the, in the second wave, if you will, or in the early 2000s. Roland Griffiths heads a lab, a team there. And in 2016, they put out findings of one of their research studies around life anxiety or life-threatening illness. So they gave uh, cancer patients psilocybin and they wanted to see what that would do for their anxiety slash depression. Palliative care? Or not was it a bit? Palliative care. Because they're not but it was life. life threatening. Wow. So they could have died uh, through this. And so you imagine uh, most people would probably freak the fuck out. 
uh, with a diagnosis like that. And then the, the treatment and the right and the, it would the lower the your immune system too. Immune system. So you're trying to fight this thing, and the stress of the situation yes. is 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 hurting your ability to fight fight it. In the to first fight place. that, and also even closing you off. You know, pain has this thing of just bringing us in of, in a survival way, which then cuts us off from our amazing resources of friends and family and others, pets, all, all the things. So, so they gave. Uh, psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. And what they found was that there were um, um, rapid and large uh, effects of decreasing anxiety and depression. So this was excellent, excellent news. I'll come back to why the rapid part is so important. Um, but jumping to in 2020, they did another study uh, that built on this because there's a lot of different types of depression. And that type of depression that was in response to a diagnosis and in, in, in an illness, um, the study that they published in 2020 was around um, major depressive disorder. So this is a different kettle of fish and a much bigger pond, if you will. Uh, it said wow. that 10% of the U.S. population would uh, meet the criteria oh, wow. for major depressive depressive disorder. So they wanted to, the, the question they were asking, how would psilocybin treat uh, this different type of and, and wider ranging type of depression? And here's what they found. Drum roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, spoiler alert. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Crushed. They gave uh, participants two doses uh, spaced out two separate doses in a controlled, supportive setting. And what they found is they found a rapid and significant decrease in anxiety and depression in the majority of the participants. And even within that, half of the people in that study um, no longer qualified for the same level of depression. Right. They were low, they were dropped into like a, a more normal range of depression. So a, a couple things with this. I mentioned the rapid. A lot of times, and the treatments out there for depression and anxiety, they often take weeks or months. Yep. I, they, so, and you know yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I know, was on, you know. Yeah, I was on yeah. pharmaceuticals for depression yeah. and anxiety and was significantly healed working with psilocybin mushrooms. And my brother Shane was, uh, I would say, severe depression. Because I remember before he worked with mushrooms, I woke up, we were at a hotel in New Orleans, and I heard crying, and my mm. brother was on the ledge. In oh, the shit. middle of the night, I woke up, and I'm naked, just asleep fucking naked, <laughs> and I run out and grab him and just hold him, and he's just crying, so he can't do it anymore. And like six months later, I worked with mushrooms, and healed him like that. Done. Cue the goosebumps. Done. Oh, you know, oh. he's, he's one of those well-adjusted, beautiful men I know. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, so beautiful. so so point is... The rapid. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. They're full on 110%. Board. So there's the rapid uh, level of the, of the treatment, and there's also um, without the undesirable side effects that so many, right. maybe you can speak to that, the, the side effects, un unwanted side effects that can come with it's, pharmaceuticals. That's the thing. Pharmaceuticals, being on pharmaceuticals and thinking you're healthy is like taking a loan out from a bank and thinking you're rich. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you're not. You're just putting yeah. a, a mat, you're putting a, a Band-Aid on a gunshot wound. Mm. And the person that needs an on switch needs an off switch. And it begins this cycle of abuse. Uh, it perpetuates the consciousness, the placebo consciousness of believing that something is wrong with you and you need an outside substance to heal it. And that in itself is a disease and a diseased consciousness. And it's very much a metaphor for all of the problems we have and for you to perpetuate that model that you need something else or someone else to heal you or to for you to feel right and something else and once you crash from the meds to make you feel right again it is a completely fallible uh m way of being mm -hmm. and it's antithetical to healing mm -hmm. once you really understand how to how to heal oneself yeah man spot on um and it really brings up the point of a paradigm shift Right, so in, and which is, this medicine. is what this is, yes. yes. And so traditionally, psychotherapy, great, obviously, I'm biased and a big fan. It's amazing. And, and it can, even with the advances in the movement towards somatic-based trauma healing. What's somatic-based? Um, it really brings in the wisdom of the body. 
So we're accessing, it's not just talking about the story, but it's listening, it's, it's noticing sensations and letting, letting the body kind of speak and bring that in. So that's, that's coming out more and more. But even with that, by and large, tr- traditional psychotherapy stays a bit intellectual, cognitive. Psychopharmacology, you know, medicines, they're, they're just kind of throwing medicines at people for different things and then medicines to help with the side effects of that medicine. And, and you know, there's downsides to that. All along, people are coming to, to therapy because they're uh, simplified, is they're stuck in someone. They need, they're suffering and they need some change. And so what we're, the paradigm shift is enhanced therapy. Or, or using medicine along with counseling or psychotherapy in a way that, sure, biologically for a, a while we can turn down the fear, we can increase the trust and empathy and rework, revisit tr- traumatic material. Or we can have with ketamine the space from certain aspects and then kind of get a different perspective from that. So we're using the medicines, plant medicines, synthetics, in conjunction with therapy that support people to go amazing. beyond the medicine experience and integrate things into their life. That's so amazing. The importance of having, look, people call them many different things. You call it, you know, a, a shaman, a guardian, a guide, mm-hmm. a doctor, you know, the importance of that. And one thing I love about you and I love about the work you're doing and how you're training uh, people to do this work, it's so important for me of being someone that was drugged uh, for, uh, since I was a kid. It, Working, if you're working with someone, having it be someone who's worked with the medicine they're giving you, you know, to have these doctors giving me stuff that they wouldn't take, you know, I'm like, it's just a completely flawed model. And any, you know, medicine woman or, or, or medicine man who I've met outside of the West or worked with, they were just someone who had healed themselves or, and often who had healed what I was dealing with and they knew how to do it. And that comfort, uh, I, I just think that's another fallacy of the Western model is if they're not going to take, if they wouldn't take what they're giving you, then they shouldn't be giving it to you. Yeah. I, as far as medicine in this space, I, I totally agree right. to be in deep relationship with the medicine that they're, that they're, um, that they're facilitating. Of course, there's a place for all of Western medicine. You know, if I, if there's a, a trauma, uh, impact trauma car accident situation, I want to go and I want to get, right. you know, the medicine and the, and the things that take care of that acute situation. Mm-hmm. But this different model of accessing empowering an innate inner healing capacity and it's really important as you were as you were pointing to like not only our own kind of if we talk set and setting set um, is of the mindset and the mindset not only of the participant or the one doing the journey but also of the facilitator whether that be a, a licensed trained therapist or a guide or a sitter so the mindset um, and this is where um you know, my wish is for everyone to have a super experienced, well-trained therapist at their side for all that. And the reality is, is that's, you know, there's a bottleneck. The, as, of, as of years ago, the, um, the demand outweighed the supply. Right. And that's only going to increase as we are, we're going to shift that. But the, the demand, as more research comes out from these institutions, it's going to grow. So we want to bring a lot of care um, not only intelligence, knowledge about the substances that are being used, right. but the ethical uh, and safety components right. of this space. Uh, and I'm so grateful that you know you're the one of the people doing training these legions of psychotherapists that are entering the space. Something I want to get into that's a little wooier side of this, but like you said, there's a bottleneck, and how do you know if you're working with these medicines clinically? make sure they work with them themselves. And this is a little bit more on the shamanic side of things, but one of the things I find doing this work that, so we're talking a lot about energy and which is very vitalistic and a little ephemeral compared to kind of the conventional Western model, but everything's sort of frequency. And when you work with these medicines, they tune your frequency, specifically the plant medicines. And there's some studies, I'll talk about a bunch on this show, around meditation. People who meditate, not only do they decrease their levels of anxiety, but they do for people in a 20 to 30 Mm. foot range Mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. So it's to be like, what is that? Well, we have a morphogenetic field, this electromagnetic field that extends beyond our body, and it is a tuning device, right? And so when you have someone that has worked 
with these medicines on a deep level and have gone very deep, they are tuned to those higher frequencies and it will help shepherd you towards those frequencies, connect you and align you. And and the opposite is true, just like the placebo and the nocebo. If it's somebody who is very traumatized, let's say they're in medicine for the wrong reasons because they're because mm-hmm. they wanted money and, and, or to impress their parents or whatever it is, they don't work with psychedelics and they're trying to profit off of them, they will have a frequency that will be detrimental to you. And it's really hard to quantify this. There's no double blind study that is going going to that is going to help you know pr- prove this but this is my experience in working with shamans and healed people in different types and finding facilitators that are going to be constructive and not deconstructive to your well-being when experimenting or y- healing through these modalities mm-hmm. wow you made a lot of great points in there and i'm fresh off of a um training training uh um, our second cohort through PCH, the Psychedelic Coalition for Health. So we were in Topanga and trained 20 therapists to work with. We used ketamine because it's legal. It was an experiential training. And to pick up on the point of um, frequency, so there are half of the trainees are in a medicine journey and half sitting for those. Oh my God. And the language and the things that were popping up and out both during, I mean, my dear colleague, Lauren Taus, who uh, co-founded the organization, we are um, being witness to hearing things happening over here that are seemingly very related to something happening. There's some play happening in the field and in the space of this room. Right. And then as we debrief and share afterwards, we hear even more connections in this space that people went into together. To, to people even who are in the medicine, not of the medicine, having certain, certain like synchronicities and yes. connections. Yeah. Super fascinating phenomenon because there was a medicine they used to call telepathin, right? Uh, did you ever hear? Okay, I won't I go on this tangent. Yeah. <laughs> There's an old name for uh, a psychedelic medicine in South America because people were developing telepathy within circle. Might fascinating component. That. When yeah. you do formal ceremonial work with some of these ancient plants, you, it, you pr- typically, depending on... What where you are in the world, you practice something called noble silence. Mm-hmm. But it's really fascinating. Someone like, let's say, my fiance, I'll use her story as an example. Uh, I And I've told this story on the show before, but essentially she healed a lower back injury through healing trauma around going to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Uh, she had a go to her childhood self who was hiding, having to go to the bathroom, a lot of shame in her household about, mm-hmm. about taking a shit. And she had to do this healing, purged afterwards, hasn't had a back problem uh, since. By the way, the back problem came from getting hit by a car when she was 12, so it makes no sense the connection. Her back scoliosis all bent and fucked up, completely healed. It's been years now. But the next day, they're in an integration circle. Someone goes, you know, really weird in ceremony, I... I had this song come to me about teaching my three-year-old daughter how to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and he just plays on yeah. and that, you know, it's one of those weird things. Like uh-huh. you're, we're connected and getting the mm-hmm. same message. You're teaching your little girl yeah. how to celebrate going to the bathroom while this other person across the room is healing a trauma yeah. from when she's three of going to the bathroom. And it's, it's quite amazing. And it's that same meditative mm-hmm. effect, the same placebo, nocebo, that energy field. You don't have to be in the medicine. If you're yeah. in the proximity, you're going to get some of the effects and it's going to help give you some of that movement, which mm-hmm. is a whole, whole nother thing. Yeah. So, wow. So just uh, a note back to the, the space and really creating a, uh, a safe and trustworthy space. And this the last piece you're, you're mentioning, it's, it makes me think of just groups. Like right now, the research is done pretty much one-on-one, our co-therapy team, right. one person, but both for access and for the wisdom in the room. Um, of having people in a medicine space. Some medicines are kind of prone to that's the way either culture in different cultures that they're held. Ayahuasca is mostly in a, in a group. Mm. Um, different medicines can tend to be kind of solo journeys inside. But as we are on this kind of the wild west in ways of this, of, of bringing these medicines into the mainstream, how, what are the ways that we can work Individually and in community, right. in families, right. in, 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 in spaces where we're, we're doing, yes, individual healing, but also um, conflict, conflict resolution and, and right. other, other ways to use these medicines. Which I'm so glad you bring that up because there's no label for the relationship wounds that like depression or anxiety or PTSD or CDE. Those are very internal diagnoses, right? But they manifest in this disconnect. And when we talk about 
you know, it's sort of heal the self to heal the whole. Once you've done this individual work that we have a lot of traumas and programming and disconnect energy around community, the family structure, you can look at the the way we treat the elderly uh, at this point in time. And then taking that healing from the individual level to a collective and communal level. And that's really the implications of these plants. One of the reasons I've given my life to them is because whether we're looking at uh, what's happening to our soil or our food or, uh, you know, climate change or racism, gender equality, anything, a prison industrial complex, military industrial, whatever you want to want to go, those are symptoms of a sick consciousness and, and their communal societal thing. So how, when we bring, having to start to, when we can start to come together and not need to sedate ourselves with alcohol and we can come together with a healing consciousness. And I really think we need to do that right now. I think it's sort of like, let's not make small talk and talk about the weather and the traffic mm-hmm. and the game. Like let's talk about like healing so we can move this energy. We can start to have lighter communal social experiences where we don't need these sort of like, to, you know, these, these crutches to mm-hmm. even just feel like we can connect without mm-hmm. feeling judged or having these, uh, these, these, ill feelings come to the surface. Yeah, I so agree. I appreciate you using the phrase whole or wholeness. Uh, back to that paradigm shift. This, this is a, a staple of that, that we can access our innate wholeness versus a disconnection, fractured sense of self. And of course, around the world, in our, in our, in our homes, in our relationships at work, in, you know, our, what we're suffering with inside, of course, plays out outside and on a global scale as well. So if we can heal um, in community, I, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> where it's at. That's the point, right? Yeah. It's something interesting about this work is it seems like all disease is this disconnect energy. So whether it's with the self or with each other or with a brother and sister or with a mother and father or whatever, it's just so e- healing that disconnect so we can come together as one. It seems that that sort of is the point. If you want to remove all the titles and kind of really strip it down to a binary, it's just yeah. disconnect and connection. Yeah. Now, Cody, can I share a story about... Please, um, brother. Yeah, <laughs> okay, why, so it's on, on this. It, it's, it's reminding me. So my dad um, was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Um, oh my God, when? Um, a number of years ago. He's, he's outlived his prognosis. Oh my God. Um, um, Did you do him any work with him weeks. around psychedelics? Well, he has had a, a, a psychedelic uh, experience, psilocybin. And, you know, I Amazing. described how I came up, you know, I'm pretty square as far as, as drugs. Yeah, dude, same with my cannabis family. until super late. And then my dad, I mean, I don't know that he's ever <laughs> had a puff of weed. Same. My yeah. parents too. Right. Okay. Same, same okay. story. So here he is and now having his first ever experiences with psilocybin. And he is years into this diagnosis, which was really challenging as it is for, for probably everyone. Losing a sense of identity, the things that he could do out in the world. He's kind of being taken away oh. by, by physical limitations, everything from his vision to, to mobility. And within the first hour of this psilocybin experience, he was mostly internal. And one of the the first things he said was, well, I know what it's like to die now. And those were the words, but if I could relay the amount of peace and ease that went in with, with that and that has been, maintained it's a reference point for him that he looks back to um he and and it also brings into just like family work or or how that his work with psilocybin in a in a in a safe container then ripples out to his family he's become more available to me and my siblings and his wife so this work, uh, yes, at end of life, of how it can be not only for people suffering from anxiety, but how it ripples out in families when we become more present and what we kind of we call it like what we don't pass down right. to other generations. Right. Breaking ancestral trauma That's right. is actually the, some, something I'm most fascinated about because doing this work, it's crazy. It, you really experience how connected we are. And when I go into doing a healing on something individually, I am flabbergasted by 
be you don't because the medicines will show you where it's coming from. It's like father's father and parents' parents. I've been taking to the beginning of fucking time where you're seeing like the first woman being oppressed by this sort of this patriarchal energy when I was healing some sort of mass parts of my masculine identity and to, you know, breaking ancestral trauma. That's really what this is. And there's a level to this work. There's the individual, but there's also, we call them medicine warriors for a reason. And this is an easy work. And, but if you, and you don't necessarily need to be sick to come to this work. I think we all have healing and growth, but if you have the courage mm to come to this medicine and to heal for your family, to break these cycles, there is a, an ability, and this does lend itself a little bit more to the shamanic component of proxying. Mm-hmm. You can proxy. I've literally, I've been a part of many healings where I've proxied for someone else. And if mm-hmm. I'm in a situation where I'm holding space and I have someone in the ceremony who cannot heal or will not let go and because I don't, I don't like to do hands-on healing anymore because there's a lot of transfer and it also perpetuates the illusion that an external force is going to help them. And I do not want them. They need to think it, believe they need to not look at me. They need to feel it from themselves. They need to, they need to go through it, you know? So I will instead, I was getting very deep into my, my shamanic practice, but I can isolate in the room and pull out some tools and I can proxy for them and move this energy. And it's a fascinating experience. Uh, it's how connected we all are, uh, is, is blows my mind. And it's just this, this, this always staring me in the face of essentially until we are not well until all, it, we, we, none of us are well until all of us are well. We have these things like cancer and this and that, but and we think we know where they're coming from. They're coming from inflammation or the mitochondria is not functioning, whatever it is. But it is a it is so much deeper than that. It's these traumas we're holding on to. It's pollutants. It's this, that. And I, I I I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say here is that I love hearing you talk about ancestral trauma. Is that something you're seeing in your studies? Yes. In a word, yes. I, I see it in my private practice. And I see my private practice without any medicine involved that um, the uh, aforementioned IFS, internal family systems, people can access um, uh, grandparents that have information for them. Grandparents that they have not met. Um, and I know it's this for woo-woo for, for many people, but I, I assure you I've been in, in grounded spaces where information was was happening that that turned out to be very useful. Oh, this is just fact. Yeah. This is just and fact. People yes. reliving r- r- sexual assault and mm-hmm. then they go to that grandparent and they find out they were sexually assaulted yeah. so many times. Yes. I see this over and over again. Yes, and I think it's 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 uh, psychedelics have that. That's part of the potential of them. They make a lot of connections in right. the brain. They, they open us up to receive more information. And so that is also where I want to plug for um, um, being really thoughtful and I would even say kind with yourself in choosing. Um, I know my wish is for everyone to have a super well-trained therapist and the, the great, the best of set and settings. But if you're doing work with someone who uh, is not licensed and trained and it's not within that same container, is this someone that you trust? Have you spent time getting to know and be known by this person? Have they asked you questions about what medication you're taking early childhood trauma, what are your resources, what do you, did they take time to prepare, did they talk about integration and what that will look like after? So it's a really vulnerable, valuable space to be in, so I want to just everyone to bring a lot of care into that space. That's great. I'd actually love to hear you talk a little bit more about what people can look for uh, when seeking out psychedelic plant medicines, what it can heal, uh, how to prepare for them. And so you went over a couple studies. Can you just kind of blanketly talk about what evidentially psychedelics have been shown to heal? Uh, You said PTSD. Uh, You talked about sort of a palliative care or a fear of death, uh, depression, and anxiety. Is there any other things you've seen psychedelics have the ability to heal? Uh, Yes. And again, we're we're, um, just getting started. And then as these medicines become rescheduled, I mean, as it is now and for the last, you know, couple decades, any well-respected, even wise researcher, they would have to put their their livelihood on the line 
to research something that they didn't know would have any like possibility of actually getting out in the world. So as that opens up, there will be more and more research. So just to say we're, we're at the beginning of this, PTSD, um, anxiety and depression, and there is a wide range of anxiety and depression, eating disorders, um, addictions of different varieties, and the, the, the main piece, and you mentioned it earlier, coming back to wholeness. So we, I don't know that anyone makes it out of childhood unscathed with some things, whether it be around attachment or intimacy or boundaries. Right. Um, and so even beyond what the kind of clinical diagnosis might be, um, my, my hope and, and, and what seems to be the trajectory is that these medicines can become available for, there's the phrase for, for well people. Um, right. That can be for consciousness exploration and beyond for, for, for community, for rites of passage and, and on and on. But to your question, the research is, is vast in, in exploring. That's, some, that's something really interesting that I want to touch upon. You said for well people, because these modalities have the ability to uplift uh, and heal without needing a clinical diagnosis or having a mood disorder. Uh, tremendous healing, uh, give, give people a greater sense of well-being. And one of the things with, you know, I'll touch upon MDMA, when I came to this work, it was very formal. I was raised straight edge, so I went into formal ceremonies. I took signs off their eye, got brain scans before and after blood work, like tried to measure all the effects of it. So I really wanted to at least create the illusion for myself that I was not doing drugs. So like I was, you know, cause I had that program. Right. And even after doing this work for a little bit, I still was a little self serious and I'm a bit of a workaholic. And my sister was like, Cody, you got to come with me. She's like, you have to come to this festival and took me to a festival. It's called lighting in a bottle. People call it a transformational festival for the first time I worked with MDMA. Uh, and it changed my life. Uh, abso- absolutely changed my life in a way that is unquantifiable, undiagnosable. How can you, you can't diagnose for somebody losing the gift of dance, of expression through their body. I mean, I remember I would go to dance and just thinking about how do I look? How do I look? Stay like white safe, guy right dance, right? Yeah. Right. There's that mm-hmm. great Osho quote, dance until the dancer is gone, you know? Mm-hmm. And and just a few days at a festival working with those modalities in a not so clinical studying healed me, transformed me, connected me through self expression, through my fashion, uh, dance, to sing, to play, completely rewired me in a way that was kind of far beyond the the clinical formal shamanic work I was doing and it reconnected me to the point of life which is ecstasy it's to be in community and to dance and sing and express joy that is the highest expression of of existence of being and for us to, I, I, I on the show a lot there's a bit of compartmentalizing to be like oh we're we doing it the right way or are you integrating are you taking this are you doing the dieta but at the same time th- what's been happening for for many, many years is we live in a sick society and people are very disenfranchised and they're sick and they have, they have these mood disorders and they go to these subcultures, these festivals, these raves to escape and typically sedate themselves. And they go from alcohol to one thing to the next thing and they end up wandering into these healing modalities and they end up finding healing, but in the underground in a way that's not safe and monitored. But I just love hearing you talk about this is something that can be uplifting for society and heal us and bring us together and help us overcome our differences. And I, I don't want, as much as I want to like put the emphasis on doing it clinically and professionally and shamanically or whatever you want to call it, there is also a cell, there is a, it just because if people use these to celebrate and socialize and heal consciously in that way to consciously come together in community, Mm -hmm. I think it's just as powerful, if not more powerful. Wow, I agree. They, uh, I won't get the quote just right, but um, it, the, the, the gist of it is, is a story of when sick people used to come to the shaman, the questions, the questions that the shaman would ask, when did you stop laughing? When did you stop dancing? When did you stop singing? Thank you. Thank you. And that's one of the main things when you see, because it's, yes, you're healing these things, but what's on the other side of the alleviation of that symptom? What does that look like? Well, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like I see people sing for the first time in ceremony. I see people grab an instrument. I have chills as well. I grab an instrument and play 
a song for the first time ever in their life and go, I didn't even know I had that in me. Get up and dance in community to laugh and to hug and to celebrate together. It That's what it looks like. And one of the great things with psychedelics is it shows us where we're going. It can take you home. It can show you the point. It can show you an awakened state of consciousness. And then you kind of takes you back to where you are and you get to work towards that. Same thing with these communities. You get to see divine ecstasy, divine play, divine community, union, union coming together. And that is what we're working towards. So I don't want anyone to think, oh, you're you're using this outside of a clinical setting. Oh, this is illegal. No, this is this is this is these are sovereign modalities. We're sovereign people and coming together in unity, working with these modalities consciously mm-hmm. is tremendously healing and it's the future yeah. it really is i i concur um from in my, my research hat on I, I, you know this is the way that things get in the society that they get to become more available and it opens into this space i love how you took it to like what happens after a healing and i would say that's very much part of uh, preparation and integration process is is having some things on the radar and also being open to doing things that are challenging. We talked about the ski slope uh, metaphor. It takes time to lay down new tracks, new tracks of boundaries, uh, willingness to show up in, uh, in intimacy and vulnerability. Um, these, it, it's getting back to this paradigm shift of a, a wholeness. And we have this inside of us. Medicines can help dance on its own. Uh, exercise and, and singing and, and all these other factors on their own, holotropic breath work. But medicines certainly are a um, one means to help us reconnect with our wholeness. So if people want to work with these modalities, uh, is there any place you would tell people to go to to work with them? Where would you have people start? Uh, what would you recommend? Maybe certain things for certain conditions, certain things for other conditions. Mm-hmm. A little bit of guidance for the listeners would be phenomenal. Yeah. Very helpful. Um, I know it's a tough tar- well, tar- yeah. Tar- yeah, and it's listen. So. Cody, in, in years to come, my response is going to be much more vast because more things are going to be available. Um, as of now, ketamine is the uh, psychedelic, is, if we keep it in these terms, psychedelic is that's uh, available here in Los Angeles. Um, there's a number of people like myself in, in private practice. But there's also uh, clinics. Um, the California Center for Psychedelic Therapies uh, is founded by my MAPS colleagues. It's in uh, it's Hollywood, right around the corner here. Um, there are uh, online ways of, of connecting. Um, my colleague uh, Ashley developed the AWARE project. There's a lot of great information. I want to highlight one bit there is that there's questions to ask yourself in terms of doing work with, say, an underground practitioner. There's questions to ask yourself, to ask the practitioner, and that the practitioner should be asking you. So it's good to get informed around that. Another resource, psychedelic.support. It has a lot of information and training research-backed um, and then as far as underground and, and a wide-ranging um, collaboration of, of information, erowid.com, E-R-O-W-I-D. There's a lot of different reports of how people's experiences. There's information there about dose. Of course, it, it primes the set and setting as well. If you're interested in the research, going to maps.org, you can um, apply to be a participant in the research. That's a big one. Yeah. I think that's that's a big one for people to start. And what do people need to know? Because, right, it's, they're in the underground. So whenever something is pushed into the underground, the problem with the drug war is it makes these substances, uh, it's harder to... Uh, to to quality control, mm-hmm. right? So and to trust the source and who's holding the space. Mm-hmm. So those are sources where you can get more information on maps. People can sign up to do clinical trials if they if they choose to. Uh, what about um, for plant medicines? Uh, do you know any place you really like the, with plant medicines? Or and and also, is there what do people need to do to prepare? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I support people doing this work. Um, you know, we call it underground, but perhaps we could even call it like the ground uh, because it's like, uh, you know, kind of of the earth up, yeah. and, it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. It's, and it's rising up. Um, I don't have particular organizations um, outside of the country uh, that I can recommend. 
Though, as far as the preparation, um, meeting with, if, if you have the good fortune of being able to work with a therapist, uh, asking your, including that in uh, a therapy process, even if they're not, you know, able to be there in the session that can help with preparation and therapists, um, can learn a lot about how to help uh, their clients integrate. Um, other, other resources, um, I know you said plant medicine, but holotropic breathwork can be as psychedelic as anything right. else. And so that is a way without medicine to, to have, a, have an experience that can be a, a peak moment. Also, that requires uh, integration. Right. Thank you for bringing that up because entering altered states of consciousness without uh, using psychedelics, because psychedelics are very intense. It's like, you know, it's it's going from zero to, to 50, right? Mm -hmm. There's a holotropic breath work, all sorts of breath work, meditation practices. Those can, pra not only will they be helpful for learning how to navigate altered states of consciousness, but also they're tools for when you are in the medicine, you can go back to your breath, you can go back to your presence, you can go back to, you can, uh, you can go to meditation, and it's going to help you navigate and get through these experiences. And one of the things with, let's say, shamanism or doing any sort of this work, a lot of it, these are just tools for when in the space to navigate and heal and assist as we we were saying a lot of these modalities actually aren't mutually exclusive and they can actually go hand in hand to elicit certain types of healings or to treat a certain person to perhaps get them to open up more, to go into their heart, uh, to disassociate if they have a strong ego and so on and so forth. So I love that you're directing people to look into hot tropic breath work, look at Wim Hof is really amazing. Uh, do you do you train? Have you trained with Stanislav Grav? I have not personally. I've, I've met the man and gave him a deep bow. Nice. Um, but um, different than uh, Wim Hof, holotropic breath work brings different tools in. And I, if people are interested, I'd have them uh, really look in how uh, many forms of breath work breath play uh, can be really useful and, and grounding. Um, holotropic is a is is a, is a particular uh, branch of that. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned meditation, mindfulness or, or meditation, uh, both in a session and, and, and preparing and, and post. Uh, Stan Groff uh, called psychedelics a non-specific amplifier. So imagine like kind of uh, what's a, would be a metaphor. It's just like not knowing the space of the unconscious and then having it amplified. Right. Whereas when we sit in in meditation, we start to know a little bit of the lay of the land. We hear, we know thoughts, we know sensations, and we're able to assess these out a little bit. And so having that as a grounding um, feels like a very uh, self-loving and supportive for, for better outcomes too. Absolutely. And I'll add one thing. This is a little left field, but I actually use cold therapy and contact showers every day to train myself for the moment of radical shift that comes. I throw it on, I put myself and I try to still and not react to it. Because one of the things with these sort of medicines, when if you want to go deeper in, especially when it comes to a spiritual interface, if you react, if you pull away from it, it's a dance. So if you pull away from your partner, you're, you, you, you might close off that bridge and not be able to make that jump and not be able to necessarily get the transformational aspect that these higher doses can bring about or these more direct experiences, the, the, the very direct experiences can bring about. So that's something I do to train myself. So when I am startled with an extremely high frequency or the presence of something that is not familiar to me, I cannot react and integrate with that energy to receive the healing. Great. I want to highlight that for your for your audience. So I'm I'm I, I, I dig cold exposure and actually the uh, Wim Hof work or the the breath retention after rapid breathing and then holding. We're getting to a point where we're our our, our mind starts to freak out a little bit. Like it's like this is uncomfortable and this is uncomfortable and what what are we going to do? And so when we can practice that, particularly on the daily, whether it's cold exposure or breath retention or breath work, it, it helps us know the lay of the land of ourself so that when we have these experiences or just the interaction in L.A. traffic or, or with our partner or whomever it might be, we know ourself and we have some more options of like, oh, here's this part that's getting triggered or stirred or here's the, look at me, I, I can tell that I'm pulling back right now. So 
Psychedelics can help us know ourselves more and any preparatory work we can do um, will advance that work or deepen that work. Amazing. Amazing. I, I think, because we have about five minutes left, I would love to hear, there's two things I want to know. One is, is there anything you would like people to know when it comes to going to these medicines? Uh, for me, it's I always want people to be responsible, uh, to really do their research, uh, to f- you know find a safe, reliable source, uh, and you know honor where these medicines came from, the indigenous people, uh, and you know to just be extremely conscious. Mm-hmm. Uh, but is there anything for you personally you would like to instill upon the listeners? Yeah, um, actually, similar to to what we did here, we took a, a full a full beat, a full pause to kind of check in with ourselves before starting this podcast. I encourage people to be honest with themselves of what it is that they really want and what is it that they need. Psychedelics, amongst many things, can be used to go towards yourself or away from yourself. So know what you're seeking and get creative with the ways you can support yourself with that if that's conversations, if that's taking on morning practices, um, medicine, these medicines are not a panacea. You're not going to get a, an injection or smoke something or take something and then your life's going to change in of itself. It's You might have a peak moment or at least set people up like this. You might have a peak moment. You may not have a peak moment. And then how do you bring that into your life? How does that in, impact the choices you make on the daily that bring about more presence, more community, more intimacy, uh, more fun. Yeah, more dance. More play. Yeah, more play. Beautiful. And on our last question, just because I, I want, it's a lot of big ideas and I would love to, you know, in a grounded manner, what is your daily practice, your health, your mindfulness, your spiritual practice? Is there anything you can, can you plug us into your daily practice? I'm a big believer, master 24 hours, master your life. Mm. And I would love to hear your practice just to share with the world. Yeah, yeah. sure thing. So currently I, I am I'm doing my best to take care of my mornings. So I get up and then I have a space. I, I have some things kind of on auto, like I know where I'm going to go. I'm not strolling around the house, picking up different things. I have a space with a cushion and I have a couple books. So I'll read a little bit from a book. I will, uh, whether it be poetry or something psychological or psychedelic, um, I'll do a bit of meditation, followed by some breath work, breath play at other times. Um, there will be a, a coffee uh, in, involved in that along the way. And then I set an intention. I, I schedule when I'm going to get some movement because currently I'm, I'm sitting a lot, being with people. Um, so I'll schedule the movement um, and gratitude uh, practice. It's my wife is amazing and an easy target for so much gratitude. I'm in I'm my family and, and friends. So I spend a little time. It's a, it's a heart opener, this, this, this thing, gratitude, to spend literally a minute clock time connecting with gratitude it's so beautiful I, I, we have a very similar practice mm. I, I do believe we finish our day as we start our day mm. and i also as we work with these modalities something like ayahuasca and dimethyltryptamine in those morning states of consciousness you are producing more of that melatonin dimethyltryptamine you are in closer to that dream state of consciousness that altered state of consciousness and t- a really good time to you have more plasticity in your neurology. You can so tapping into the gratitude, bringing about movement, uh, you know, doing that breath work right then and there. Uh, it really those first four hours, if you can start your day with that practice, that is a really amazing tools for integration. And honestly, what you just said, that is taking the medicine and hmm. beca- you know, beca- being healed and and bringing it into a daily practice. And that really is the work. It's where the work begins, the real work. Yeah. I appreciate that. And I am reaping the the benefits of it. Yeah. Dr. Bruce, you are fucking dope. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Uh being on. Uh, we'd love to have you on again another time. Uh, you truly an angel brother, like, Mm. like lead the charge. Thank you for being like just a thought leader. And at the forefront of this movement, we all 
appreciate you and respect you and love you so much. Seriously. Cody, much appreciation. Appreciate all that. I love what you're doing here. I love uh, the heart that you're bringing uh, in, on top of the, the knowledge. Much appreciated. Yeah, same, brother. It takes one and now on. Yeah. 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 All right, everyone. This has been the Awakened Underground Podcast. Thank you so much and tune in to next episode. Be well. That's our show. Thank you for listening to the Awakened Underground Podcast. We appreciate your time, attention, and support. Please be sure to hit the subscribe button. Throughout the season, we will be interviewing doctors, scientists, shamans, thought leaders, and celebrities who work with psychedelic medicines and are ready to come out from the underground to share their stories of healing with the world and what these medicines have to teach us about the true nature of reality. The Awakened Underground is a production of Calvary Audio in association with iHeartRadio. The Awakened Underground is created and hosted by Cody Blue, directed by Tanya Dahl, produced by Cody Blue and Jeff Apple, executive produced by Dana Bernetti and Keegan Rosenberger, co-executive produced by Jason Seagraves and Brandon Morgan, with post-production supervision, editing, and sound mixing by Josh Windish. And a very special thanks to Daniel DeLoretto, Eric Klein, Alexander Chinisi, Armand Zadie, David Grillo of Thank You Plant Medicine, our teachers, First Nations people, our ancestors, our family, and these sacred plants. Yeah.